Is that really his primary objective is getting a deal done while he's in the region or is he still busy trying to convince Israel not to move into Rafah? Well, I think it's both. I mean, these next few days are going to tell us a lot about whether there's going to be a ceasefire or if Israel is going to proceed with that offensive. There's supposed to be talks in Cairo tomorrow on Tuesday uh, featuring uh, Israelis, uh, the Egyptian and Qatari officials who've been moderating this, and representatives from Hamas. Now, there's been optimism that uh, there could be a deal. Israel has lowered the number of hostages it said it would require. Uh, to see a deal. But there's still other things that need to be worked out, like the length of a ceasefire, like whether Palestinians can have immediate return to Gaza. If those conditions are satisfied, we could see a deal. But if those negotiations fall apart, you could see Israel moving very quickly to prepare for that Rafa offensive. Well, as Speaker uh, Mike Johnson uh, makes news today, he was, of course, on Columbia's campus last weekend as the university tries to break up the encampment here. He's talking about potential congressional action uh, not towards the conflict in Gaza, but to college campuses with an announcement today. Here's what we heard from the speaker. With regard to the funding, we're, we're looking at very seriously uh, reducing or eliminating any federal funds at all to campuses who cannot maintain basic safety and security of Jewish students. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds ridiculous to say that this is what it's come to, but that's what we're looking at. Jordan, is this just messaging from the speaker here? Could something like that actually get through this Congress in legislative form? It's hard to say. The White House didn't really bite one way or the other uh, yeah. when asked about this today. But look, you're seeing uh, you know, politicians, even though the, the protests aren't really about Joe Biden or Congress, you're seeing them rush in and they see political opportunity in what's happening on these college campuses for sure. Republicans uh, using them to try and uh, accuse Joe Biden of fostering this uh, you know, atmosphere of chaos in the United States. You know, they link it to you know, crime in cities, you know, protests on college campuses, you know, raising questions about will the left eat their own like they did in 1968 with massive protests later this summer outside their convention. And on the other hand, you have you know, Joe Biden trying to distance himself from what's going on in those college campuses, you know, denouncing some of the anti-Semitic rhetoric uh, that you've heard from some of those demonstrators. So while it's not about the politicians in Washington, there's certainly a lot of fallout for them. Yeah, Jordan, thank you for being with us. Jordan Fabian, White House correspondent at Bloomberg, as we turn now to the campaign trail where Donald Trump met with his one-time rival, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. They did so over the weekend. And we turn now to Bloomberg's Nancy Cook, who has had deep sources within both camps here. Nancy, I can't imagine what you thought as they finally got in the same room in Hollywood, Florida, this, of course, is Ron DeSanctimonious, and I know that <laughs> Donald Trump retired that name officially. I don't think he's retired Meatball Ron yet. The point is, that was a brutal campaign. What's in it for Ron DeSantis to get together with Donald Trump right now? What's in it for Ron DeSantis is that he definitely wants to run for president in 2028. Um, even after he dropped out, he had a meeting with donors. You know, he is trying to keep... The, the real hope alive among his supporters that he will be, uh, you know, the, the front runner when he runs again mm -hmm. in 2028. And so he really can't afford to alienate Trump's base. You know, Trump has such a strong grip in the Republican Party. And, and Ron DeSantis, you know, wants those people in four years to come along and support him. Mm -hmm. What's in it for Trump is that Trump needs to expand his base of fundraisers. And Ron DeSantis has been very effective at cultivating a network of very wealthy Floridians um, during his, uh, you know, he's in his second term as Florida governor. And, and that's kind of, I don't think they really like each other, but I think that they <laughs> both see something that they could get from each other. Can Trump really get the people who were DeSantis donors, though? Because a lot of them were donating to DeSantis specifically because he was an alternative to Donald Trump. How much overlap is there really in the Venn diagram of who will support these two? That's a good question. There already has been some um, overlap. Um, we saw uh, Mr. Bigelow, who is a donor from Nevada, who has already come around and supported Trump. He supported DeSantis at first. Um, and so I think that, you know, the Trump people are sort of on the hunt for billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and there is a lot of money in Florida now, particularly with Wall Street moving down there. And I think that they are just, you know, really looking for support as much as I can get it. Well, on to the Veep stakes here. Yeah. This is fascinating to me. We've got a fundraiser coming up this weekend that looks like the next uh, episode of The Apprentice. Mm -hmm. uh, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance was asked about this idea of potentially running for Trump on Fox News Sunday. Here's how he responded. 
I talked to President Trump a lot. Uh, we're very close. I've never spoken to him about being vice president, so I assume that a lot of this is media speculation. Of course, if he asked me, I'd have to think seriously about it because I think it's really important that he win. The world is on fire, and I sort of see Donald Trump as a bit of a fireman. I don't know if there is even such thing as a short list at this point. You can tell us if J.D. Vance is on it, but there are several others, some familiar names here. Doug Burgum among them, who appears to be rising to the top. He's gonna, they're all going to be pulled into a room with donors this weekend. Do they end up in the boardroom at the end and he <laughs> hires someone? How does this work? So um, I, I did talk with some Trump sources today. I will say that they are um, sort of vetting people. And there are a bunch of people who want to be the VP who are getting themselves ready. They're talking with policy experts. They're hiring lawyers to get their finances in order. And so people are getting ready. I think that you know this being Trump and him being a master of messaging, mm -hmm. He is going to draw out this process as long as possible, both to have all these people competing for his approval, but also to keep sort of this interesting media storyline going, I would say right up until the convention. Doug Burgum is definitely on the list, but there's a, a bunch of people on the list. You know, Lee Stefanik is on the list, uh, Tim Scott. Uh, you know, Byron Donalds of Florida. The list is long, and it's it's not being winnowed down. And so what's going to happen this weekend is there's a big uh, Republican National Committee donor retreat in Palm Beach, Trump's backyard. He is speaking there. And a bunch of these VP candidates will also be sort of talking and schmoozing. They've done this a lot on the campaign trail, so it's not that unusual. Um, but one of my Trump sources calls it, you know, auditioning for daddy's approval over and over again. <laughs> All right, then.